Uh, okay, we're now recording. So what I was just saying is talking about when the final exam is. Uh, the office hasn't given me an exact date, but I estimate it should be in the first week of January. The earliest could be, it could be December 28th. I think that would be right at the beginning. Finals period starts on the 27th or 28th. Uh, but I estimate it'll be the first week in January. That gives us four classes left. Uh, let me turn off my AC. Oh, it's crazy to use AC in the winter, but you know, American heat, it's so warm inside, it's crazy. So we'll probably have three more classes of learning new material, then we'll have one final review class. And before the final review class, I'll give you guys some practice exams that will be similar to the one we did for, what we do, agency or contracts? We did one of them. It'll be kind of similar to that. I'll give you guys practice questions. We'll go over those in class. You know, for the final review, I'm not going to go through the whole semester and say, you know, here in offer, here's what you need to know. In acceptance, here's what you need to know. Instead, we'll do practice questions. And that will should cover everything. But right now, we're still focused on company law. So last week, we started talking about company. I know Junpyo was here and Nicola was here. So let's get started on that. OK, so last week, we started by first talking about what a company is. And then we really got into this topic of incorporation. And I said, this is 100% going to be on the final exam. So you really do need to know this. So incorporation, what is it? And the key word I said is it's a process. Incorporation isn't a thing. It's a, it's a process. It's a procedure. Now, it's a procedure to do what? It's a process to do what? Junpio or Nicola? Incorporation is a process to do what? Process to create a legal person. Yes, correct. It's a process to create a legal person. Hello, Tiffany. It's a... Hi. I'm guessing that is something in the background. Maybe somebody's cutting the lawn or having a motorcycle contest. So it is a process to create a legal person. A legal person is like you and me. It's a person. But it's slightly different. So we call a company a separate legal entity. That's the word we use. We don't say person. Usually we say entity. But it's the same idea. It's a legal person. And because a company is a legal person, it has an identity, just like you and I have an identity. So because it is a person, because it has an identity, you can sue a company, a company can sue you because it is a person, right? It is a legal person. And this is the critical idea to understand about companies, that companies are legal people. So we talked last week about the court case that established this process, and that case was Salomon v. Salomon. So Junpio, what were the two rules that we learned from this case? I don't remember, sir, sorry. Tiffany, you remember? What are the two rules we learned from this case? Tiffany? Um, uh, hi. Hi, what were the okay, two rules from it's Salomon? It's talking about how the, uh, how the legal entity for the company is Seems like there's a. It's not the same. All right, there's some sort of sound problem. There's something loud in the background. So let's go on. I'll mute you. Um, okay, there's a connection problem. Tiffany, you might need to sign out and sign back in. So, okay, the Salomon case establishes two rules. Junpio, this should be easy. They are on the screen. Number one, 
a company is responsible for its own debts. Number two, a company is a separate legal entity. These are the two rules. One, two. These are the two rules we get from Salomon. A company is a separate legal entity. A company is responsible for its own debt. So if a company owes money, like in this case, in this case, the company owed money to the bank, and you can sue the company for the money, but if the company doesn't have money, Jinpyo, if the company doesn't have money, can you sue the owner of the company? Um, I don't think so, because as it said, it's a separate legal entity. Correct. As rule number two says right here, a company is responsible for its own debt, its own debt. A company is responsible for its own debt. If a company has debt, you cannot sue the owner. You cannot sue the manager. You cannot sue the landlord. You cannot sue the vice president. The company is a person. And this person might owe money to a bank and you can sue this legal person. But that's it. You can't sue anybody else. The company is a person. Uh, we also looked at another case after this. Uh, we talked about this Makura case, the idea of owning insurance on a company's asset. So if my company has you know, a lot of wood, in this case, it was a timber company. If my company has a lot of wood and I take out insurance, that it doesn't work. I can't have insurance on the company's asset because the company is a person. Now, because the company is a person, the company has a legal personality. And this is where we stopped last week. So a company has a legal personality. And what does that mean? that it has a legal personality. It means three things. One, a company can own property. Two, a company can make contracts. And three, a company can sue and be sued in court. Okay, one, two, these are the three elements of having a legal personality. Now, when we talk about personality with people like you and I, we often mean the traits that we have. Like this person is nice. This person is angry. This person is fun. This person is humorous. You know, that's what we mean when we say personality. For a company, we don't really mean that. You know, uh, we don't say like the Apple company is nice or the IBM company or the Starbucks company, you know, we don't really use personality that way. We use it as, we use it to indicate the powers that they have. And they have three important powers. However, legal personalities do not have basic rights. So you and I are natural people. We have basic rights, the right to free speech, the right to freedom of religion. You know, so for example, I, if I want, could be Christian or Muslim, I could be, you know, can a company be Muslim? Can a company be Christian? Not really. Could it be run by Christian people? Sure. Could it be run by Muslim people? Sure. Could the company have sort of religious values? Sure. But the company itself can't be a religion. It's not possible. It's not that kind of person, but it is a person. And so it does have some powers. One power is it can own property. It really can own uh, pieces of the world. And that's an amazing power that we give it. Uh, two, it can make contracts. We've seen before in this class, contracts are this very important idea of trust. And you can establish this relationship with a company. And three, they can sue and be sued. But if I ask you, what's the most important reason? that someone starts a company? There is one answer. What's the most important reason that someone starts a company? And the answer is limited liability. Limited liability means this, a company is responsible for its own debt. Why is this so important? What do you think, uh, Carlotta, are you there? No? How about Isaac? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. 
Okay, Isaac, why is it so important if you want to start a company that it is responsible for its own debts? Why is this a, a good reason to start a company? Because um, it keeps you, keeps you safe from a lot of well, legal liability. Like we saw sure. the examples last class, when you get sued, you don't have money. You, you owe money. It's not you that owes the money, it's the company. So you're relatively safe. Sure, exactly. It provides safety. So if I, owe, if I open a company, I remember the word, I incorporate a company. So if I incorporate, which is a process to make this person, so I incorporate a company. Now let's say that I am a very rich person and I incorporate a company and my company makes a contract with Jordan. Now, Jordan, if my company breaks the contract with you, can you sue my company? You're muted. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Uh, if, so, if I make a contract with you, I can show you your company. Yes, sure. Sure. So you make a contract with my company, you can sue my company. Yes. But can you sue me? I know. I don't no. have the, any right to sue you. Right. So even if I'm a very rich person and you made a contract and you lost a lot of money, you can sue my company. But if my company does not have a lot of money, sorry, but you can't touch my money, cars, houses, assets, clothes, jewels, anything. So it's a very safe way to do business. So if it's so safe, why doesn't everybody open a company? Any thoughts? I mean, look, it's so safe. It's a great idea. Everybody should open a company. Why not? I think, I think it's because there is a cost to open a, sure. uh, a company, you know. So, Especially, for example, in, in Brazil, you have to pay your accounting every month. Sure. So there's a cost for money and time. It costs money to open a company, but more than that, it costs your time to do all the administration. But for some people, even more than that, if you open a company, you have a very high level of duty of care to the government. You need to tell the government how much money you made, what you spent your money on, what your investments were, what your salaries are, if you employ people. Now, if I open a business just by myself and I do not incorporate it, I just start doing business. So let's say today I just start selling t-shirts in America. Can I do that? Sure. Sure, I could just go on Amazon and open an Amazon store. Now, if I want, I could get a business license. I should do that because then I'll pay taxes at a lower rate. So there are benefits to getting a business license, but I just do business by myself. That's very easy to get. Now, let's say I make a contract with Jordan. Okay, Jordan, I make a contract. I'm going to sell you 10,000 shirts. And this is just my solo business. I do not have a company. And I break the contract. Can you sue me personally? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, for sure. I can sue you because you don't have a company. We can right. do that. But the advantage is if I just do business myself personally and I make a million dollars, I can do whatever I want with it and I don't need to tell the government. I don't need to pay accountants. I don't need to, I need to pay my taxes, of course, but everything else is just private. That's between me and God. I don't have to tell the government anything. So a company has a lot of requirements and it does cost money because you need to pay the fee to start a company. Um, in China, if you want to start a company like a, this kind of company, we're talking about a limited liability company, it's going to cost you about 15,000 RMB to open the company. And then every three months, you'll have to pay a fee of, I think it's three to 5,000 RMB for every quarter, every three months to your accountant. And then you'll have to pay an annual fee 
of something like seven or 10,000 RMB. So, you know, it's not a crazy amount of money. It's not millions of dollars, but we are talking about, you know, a couple thousand dollars per year. So if you're not, and you have to, your reporting is very uh, onerous. There's a lot of reporting that you need to do to the government. You need to tell them what you made, what you sold, when your meetings were, you need to hold annual meetings. But there's a lot of benefits you get if you wanna open a company. Now, if you wanted to open a company in Hong Kong right now, you still can. And Hong Kong is still under the British legal system in terms of incorporation. So if you open a company in Hong Kong, it'll cost you almost half the money. Let's say, you know, 8,000 RMB about to open the company. Because it's British, you don't need to report every three months. You report every six months. And it's less money. It's like 3,000 RMB. And the annual fee is also less. It's like 3,000. So it's a lot less money to open a British company. Two problems with oh, the sir. British company. Yeah. Uh, what in case you open company, but you don't have like income? You don't need income. Mm, but still you have to pay? Sure, yeah, these are, these are filing fees and administrative fees. Now look, if you or someone in your family is the accountant, maybe they can do the work, but typically you need a person who is licensed in China. Yeah, I just, opened a, I just opened a company. I just opened a company and everything done well. And then the people that made the company for me, they asked me to pay per year. Uh, 4,500, 3,600 okay. 3, 3, for the uh, taxes and 900 for the person that taking care of this stuff. Okay, yeah, that's not terrible. And you opened a Woofie? Woofie? Yeah, most foreigners in China open what's yes. called a Woofie. Yes, exactly. So a Woofie, W-O-F-E, is... Yes a wholly owned foreign enterprise. And that's what foreigners are allowed to own in mainland China, not Hong Kong, mainland China. Now, the benefits of a Woofie, you, it's not as expensive. You can own it. You can give yourself a visa. And yeah. you can even hire someone on a visa, right? If you need it, you have to prove that you need it. And you can't give a visa to you know, everybody in your family, but you can hire people with a visa. And another big benefit, you can give Fa Piao. You can give the government receipts, which if you really want to do business in China, it's really important to be able to give this. If you have a Hong Kong company, you can't. Now there's one, well, one or two problems with a Woofie. Number one, wholly owned foreign, which means you cannot have a Chinese partner. Now, could a Chinese person invest? Well, I mean, look, we know China, there's a big table and a lot is done under the table. So could a Chinese person invest? I don't know. Should they? No, it's not legal. Technically, you could sell stock. Uh, Jordan could sell stock to me. I'm a foreigner. To Nicola, he's a foreigner. To Isaac, he's a foreigner. You could sell stock to lots of people, but only foreigners. And that's a challenge in China, of course, because if you really do want to get big, then the investment is Chinese. So here's what most people do. Uh, in this case, a Hong Kong company can own a Woofie. So if your Woofie gets big enough that you want some Chinese partners, it's very simple. Open a Hong Kong company and sell your Woofie to the company. Now, your Hong Kong company has 100% ownership of the Chinese Woofy, and the Hong Kong company, anybody can own shares of stock of a Hong Kong company. It's international. So if you ever wanted to uh, have Chinese investors, that's what you would do. You get a Hong Kong company, you transfer the Woofy to that, and then you could sell shares. Another big benefit of doing that is it's much easier to sell an entire Hong Kong company than it is to sell a Woofy. Um, because again, if you sell it to Chinese people, they need to 
modify the form of the company because they're not foreigners. So, you know, but that's great, Jordan. It's great that you've done that. You know, the students I've known who've opened companies, it's been advantageous, it's been beneficial. And one of, you know, there's a bunch of great things about having a company. So number one is this, you know, if Jordan makes a contract with somebody and for something goes wrong, they could sue the company, but they can't sue you. And that's a very big benefit. Another really big benefit is perpetual succession. A company never dies. So this company could last for a thousand years. And that is called perpetual succession. So if a partner dies, if a president, a CEO, a vice president, they can be replaced. Apple will never die. Microsoft will never die. And that can be very scary. You know, some of these American companies or Chinese companies that you don't know if you can trust them, some of like the oil companies or the tobacco companies, it's pretty scary how much power they have and knowing that they'll never die, that they could live forever. But it's certainly a big benefit of owning a company that will never die because it's something you can pass to your children. Now, if I start doing business today just myself as David, if I die, the business dies. I can't pass it to my children. If I die, it dies. Now, I can give them the, the intellectual property rights to the name. I can let them become directors of the company and run the company, but ultimately, the company would die with me. Other benefits, the company can own property, as I already said, and that's really important. The company can make contracts. That's really important too, this idea of contractual capacity. Now, of course, the company is a legal person, not a physical person. So this must be delegated to humans. We are the natural people who actually sign the contracts, but a company can make contracts and can be sued for a tort right? Companies can sue and be sued. Now for a tort, we've learned some kinds of torts. A tort we know is a civil wrong. So it's when you do something wrong, but it's not criminal. That means it's usually negligence. It's usually an accident. Can a company make an accident that hurts people or have an accident? Sure, of course. It happens all the time that companies accidentally hurt people. It could be because the company made a product that was defective or made some kind of food or beverage that was defective. Harry, can you think of a time a company was sued? Can anybody think of a time that a company was sued for hurting people? Yeah, like the one uh, for the make the ginger beer. Sure, sure, the case we learned about the ginger beer. Any times in your life that you remember a company being sued? There was also the Starbucks coffee that was too hot. Not long um, ago. Okay, that was McDonald's coffee. But yes. Oh. I think I heard about McDonald's also being sued before. McDonald's has been sued a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So has Starbucks. Starbucks has been sued a bunch of times. Yeah, I mean, but companies have accidents. A Ford car company, for example. You know, car com uh, companies do accidentally. There have been lots of times where a food company or a pet food company may have some accident. They put the wrong thing in a bag of food and somebody gets, some animal gets sick or something and they get sued. So you can sue a company for a tort. But can you sue a company for a crime? Because to commit a crime, you have to have what's called a guilty mind, right? Typically, if I want to sue you for breaking into my house, you have to have done it on purpose. Let's say that you're walking on the sidewalk. Um, Nicola, and Jor uh, Nicola and Jordan are walking on the sidewalk outside my house. And you're just playing. You're pushing each other. You're good friends. And Jordan, you push Nicola. And Nicola, you fall over and you accidentally fall into my house. Okay, the door crashes open, you fall into my house. Can I sue you for burglary? Jordan, you say no, why not? I think you can sue him. If you don't have like cameras or something, you might think that he's trying to uh, 
break into your house. Because but did he? But he has no intention to do that. And so he's not guilty of it. Mm. He's not guilty of it because it was an accident. It wasn't burglary. Burglary is when you break into somebody's house on purpose. Kidnapping is when you steal someone and hold them on purpose. Assault is when you, or battery is when you hit someone on purpose. Anything that's a crime, pretty much, is on purpose. Now, we don't get into criminal law in this class very much. There are things that could be a crime, even if it's not on purpose. I mentioned the case of driving when you're drunk. That wouldn't be on purpose, but that could be a crime. If you steal something that's very expensive, it's a crime, even if it's now stealing, it would be on purpose. I mean, it's pretty much, it needs to be on purpose. And so, a company, uh, yeah. Sorry for this, uh, interrupting you. So how to prove that this wasn't on purpose? In which type of situation? The situation that I push uh, Nicola. Well, I think you would go to court and you would say, Nicola's my friend, I just pushed him. He didn't try to break into David's house. Okay. I mean, I have no evidence that he did. Let's also look at Nicola's police record. Oh, he's a good student. He's never committed a crime. He has enough money in his life that he doesn't need to steal. None of his family is in prison. I mean, it doesn't look like he's in a situation where he needed to break in. And you said he didn't break in. There's really no reason to believe that he did. There's no absolute proof in a lot of court cases, in a lot of criminal cases, because we just don't have a video. But even without a video, there's all of this, this other, these other forms of evidence, what, what we call hearsay or, um, forgetting the word, it would come to me, the other form of evidence. So, but a company isn't a person. A company doesn't have a mind. So how can it have a guilty mind? You know, think of the company in China, the, um, I think it was called San Lu, the San Lu Milk Company. This was years and years ago where they were putting nails, like nails into their milk. And it was killing children. I don't know if you remember this. This might've been seven years or eight years ago. It was a big scandal. They wanted the protein quantity to go up. And so they were putting nails from animals in it ground up because it has a lot of keratin and protein in the nails, but it was killing babies. They were selling baby's milk. And a lot of babies died in China. I mean, like 100,000 or something. Now, the company was doing it on purpose. It, this wasn't an accident. But the company doesn't have a mind. It doesn't have a brain. And so what we look at in a case like that is an employee who's very senior, like a CEO or a senior vice president, they can be the mind of the company. And then if the CEO is doing it on purpose, then we say the company had a guilty mind. Because obviously the company is a legal person, but it doesn't have a brain of its own. Um, a smaller example of this kind of situation was the case of Natris. So in this case, Tesco, which is a supermarket, they had a discount on washing powder, like washing your dishes. And they had posters all around the store that said, you know, $1 off or some discount. So in fact, they ran out. They had no more of this washing powder. And they started to sell other washing powder that was no discount. So somebody went and they bought this washing powder and it was regular price, there was no discount. And the manager didn't take down the signs and so a customer was charged at the higher price and the customer who obviously was a lawyer or was married to a lawyer or had a lawyer in their family, you know, cause nobody would ever do this if you had to pay a lawyer, they sued Tesco. And they said this was false advertising. Now, false advertising is a tort, right? It is wrong to false advertise. It is not a crime, but it is wrong. It depends what the advertisement is. I shouldn't say it's never a crime, but it's not a crime if you're just offering, you know, less or more money. 
something like that. And so they sued Tesco for this tort. And Tesco argued that the company took reasonable precautions. They tried to sell at the lower price. This was just a mistake. But what Natris, the defendant said is, well, in this case, it was the plaintiff. What Natris said was the manager was the mind of Tesco. And the manager knew that these posters, these signs on the wall said the wrong price and that it was deceitful. It was a lie trying to get customers to buy this thing saying there's a discount when actually there's no discount. And what the court said is the manager of Tesco is not a directing mind because his position as a manager of one Tesco is not high enough. You need to, it needs to be the CEO or a senior vice president or something like that. It can't be the manager of one store. That's not the mind of a company. Okay, so we've talked about why a company is so important. We talked about the process to make a company, incorporation and what it means. We talked about the powers that a company has. Now let's say that I make a company, I wanna do business with Jordan. And so I make a company um, because I don't want to lose my bank account, my house, my car. So I make a company called um, DWI. Okay, so there's me, David, and then there's a company, DWI. Now, DWI makes a contract with Jordan. But Jordan, here's what you don't know. DWI has no money. No office. No telephone number no bank account, nothing, okay? I went to some agent and I opened the company, but I just, I use my, my, this is my bedroom, it's my office, my telephone, my bank account. And DWI makes a deal with Jordan to buy 10,000, what are you gonna sell me? Um, sell me, sell me wigs. 10,000 wigs, women's wigs, beautiful, long blonde hair. Okay. I know. Yeah. So I make a contract, DWI makes a contract to buy 10,000 wigs and you send us the wigs and we never pay you. And I say, oh, Jordan, we're not going to pay you. What are you going to do? Uh, I will sue the company. Okay, What's go that? ahead. I don't care. What's the that? company has no money. But that, in case I can sue the representative of the company, the well, one I made. That's, that's the, the one question. Well, you made it with me. Yeah, but that's, that's true. the question. Is it fair if I can use the rule of incorporation to cheat Jordan? That's true. Not fair. And as much as law law is so far from perfect, I mean, law just it doesn't work in so many ways. But the ideals behind it are intended to be pure as much as it, it really it fails because we're humans, you know, and we're not perfect. But there is a way for Jordan to sue me. So what separates me, David, from the company DWI? There's what we call a veil. So a veil, you know, traditionally is what a woman wears when she gets married. It's a piece of cloth that you can't see through that covers her face. And then when, you, this is very traditional, very old. And then when you get married, the woman lifts the veil and then they kiss, right? This piece of cloth is called a veil. And there's a veil that separates the owner of the company from the company. And it is possible to lift that veil. Or we also say pierce, go through, to pierce the veil, it's possible. And if we do that, then Jordan could sue David and get my house, my car, my money in the bank. So this is really important, this ability to lift the veil in order to sue the true owner, because we just can't let people use this company for fraud. And a lot of people do. So sometimes people do exactly what I said. They open a company with their name and there's nothing in the company. 
no money, no office, no telephone number, no bank account, no uh, stockholders, no corporate meetings, no minutes of a meeting, nothing. It's just nothing. It's just a name. When that happens, we call that a shell company. You may have heard that word before, but a shell company is an incorporated company that has nothing inside of it. And a shell company does not offer much protection. But a lot of people don't know this. They think, oh, it's a company. I can only sue the company and that's it. So if, if it's a DWI, then I guess bad business deal, you lost your money. But it's not really true. So this idea of suing the members, that means owners. So the veil of incorporation is what separates the owners from the company. And it can be pierced or lifted. This is uh, old, it's case law. And it's also statutory law now. So if you remember the difference, case law is older. That comes from court cases. And we've seen cases from the 1600s. And you know this is not that old. Um, because the, this whole idea of the separation of an owner and a company is from 1844. So it's not that old. But now there's statutes about this also, and it is possible to pierce the veil. So the most common time that we do this is when the company was open for fraud. Just like in my example for, with Jordan. Why did I open the company DWI? Well, I opened it in order to get something from Jordan and then not pay him. That's why I opened it. Now, we were just talking about the prices of opening a company in China as foreigners. Do you know what it costs to open a, open a company in China for a Chinese person? Less than 1,000 RMB. So opening, and that's going to be true for all of us in our home countries, that opening a company is not expensive. There are things you need, such as an article of association and a memorandum of association. You could find them on Google. If you don't find them, like with Jordan's case, I would assume they gave them to you and said, hey, here's your article and memorandum and you just sign it, right? So it's not hard to open a company. In China, it would cost us more to do that, but it's not really expensive for a native. So lots of people open companies. Now, maybe what I would do is let's say I had a business. I wanna export things from China, okay? Or I wanna import into America. What if I open five businesses, five companies? One company is to import and export jade. One company is to import and export tea. One company is to import and export watches. One company is to import, you know, instead of having just one import export company, I could open five companies. What would be the benefit of having more companies? Tiffany, what would be the benefit of having more companies? in my business rather than just one company? Uh, maybe less assets in one company at a time would lead to less liabilities for the company owners. Exactly, that's exactly right. So if I have one company that does import and export, let's say I have a deal with Jordan to buy and sell Jade, and I have a deal with Tiffany to buy and sell tea, and I have a deal with Isaac to buy and sell watches, well, if I break a contract with Isaac, he could get the money from the whole import-export company. But if I have five different companies, each one is totally separate and protected. But the problem is, sometimes people go a little crazy with this. Like if you knew how many companies Alibaba has, they must have like 250 companies. And they just have, they just keep opening companies. They have so many companies for exactly this reason. And so it's very important that we be able to pierce the veil. Now, usually this is done when a company is open for fraud, but it can be done for other reasons too. Uh, it, this you don't need to know, but if there's an enemy in a time of war, so if America goes to war with Germany, we could sue the owners of a German company in America rather than suing the company because it's war. What you do need to know is number one, fraudulent purpose, and number three, a group of companies regarded as one. 
So what that means is, let's say that I open a restaurant, okay, David's Pizza Restaurant, and it is a fine dining restaurant, and I want to protect myself, David. So instead of having one company for David's Restaurant, I have a company called David's Buildings, and that company rents the building. I have a company called David's Deliveries. They deliver the pizza. Another called David's Ingredients. They're, they buy and sell the food. Another called David's Restaurant. They run the restaurant. You know, I have all these different companies. But the fact is, all of these companies are really one business. So why am I separating all these companies? Well, like Tiffany said, because I want, the, I want protection. So if my food company, or let's say my delivery company, Isaac is a delivery guy and he's driving the, the car or the motorcycle and he hits someone. Well, the delivery company maybe has almost no money. So he hits somebody and they die. They can't sue me. I'm protected. They also can't sue my restaurant or the building or the food. And that's really not fair to them because I'm making millions of dollars running this restaurant. And yet the person who Isaac hit gets nothing. That's not really fair because in fact, all of these businesses, all of these companies are one business. Uh, let's look at a few examples. Um, but before we do, one important point is the difference between a private company and a public company. And we haven't really gotten into this yet. We'll talk a little more about this later in the lesson, but it is relevant. So private companies, almost all companies in the world, and I'm talking like 99% of companies are private. Almost all companies are private. And what that means is they are not on the stock market. Public companies are, there are very, very few public companies. They own almost everything. I mean, this is that, you know, the separation between the rich and the poor kind of thing. The big companies, the IBMs and Apples and Facebooks and, um, you know, BP and all the oil and gas and energy companies, they own almost everything. And they are on the stock market. Now, that's called a public company. It is not possible there's no record of piercing the veil for a public company. So why is this true? Well, remind me, um, Nicola, what does it mean to pierce the veil? Uh, basically, it's when you uh, sue the owner or the senior employee of the company because not senior the, employee only owners only owners okay because of the the i forget the name but it's kind of uh the the company was built to in a fraudulent purpose or so on so it could be can sue it, the owner. yeah sure so you're right it means in the simple terms to sue the owners of a company mm. that's it now, here's the problem with a public company. Think of the company Apple. Nicola, how many owners does Apple have? Uh, too much, I don't know. The, the, no, I mean, everybody yeah. who owns Apple stock is an owner. Mm -hmm. Can we sue every single owner of Apple? Cannot. No, it, there's too many of them. Right, so it's really not possible. So one reason we can't pierce the veil for Apple is there's a large number of shareholders. The other reason is when you're piercing the veil, it's because there was probably fraud. Now, Apple is a person. We can always sue Apple. We can sue Apple for a tort. We can sue Apple for fraud. We can sue Apple for breach of contract. Apple is a person, they can be sued. But in terms of suing the owners of Apple, Apple has, because they're public, they have to report information to the government. Remember, this is what we said about having a company. If you go public, public means you put your company on the stock exchange. 
you have to uh, send so much information to the government every three months that we know where the money went. There's no reason to sue the owners. There's no secret here. With a private company, we're talking about usually a family company, very few shareholders, maybe even one. And it's possible that the person, David, and the company, DWI, are really the same thing. And so that's our first question when we're talking about the test. So we've talked about tests before. Here, there's a three-part test, unity, conduct, cause. So number one, unity. Now, in this case, unity is bad. You do not want unity. Unity means, in this piercing the veil situation, unity means the company and the person are one. The company and the person are one. So in my example before of DWI, you have David, I'm a person, and then you have this company. They have no office. Their office is my apartment. They have no bank account. Their bank account is my bank account. They have no telephone number. Their phone number is my phone number. They have no other shareholders. I'm the only shareholder. They have no directors or meetings or secretaries or anything. It's just me. There's no documents. It's just my notes. Is DWI really separate from David Warner? No. We're the same thing. There is unity. And that's bad because you always want to separate yourself from your company. In, if you're separated, then people could sue the company without suing you. But if you're not separated, why do you have a company if it's not to cheat people? So that's the first thing that's important that we look at. The second is conduct. And this says, did the owner open the company for a wrongful reason? So when I made this contract with Jordan or DWI made this contract with Jordan, why did I open the company DWI? Was it just to cheat Jordan? Because that, of course, is a wrongful purpose. But what if I opened the company in order to do lots of import and export in China? Jade and tea and watches and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just not very good at business. So I'm kind of mixing the money with my bank account and I don't have an office and I don't have a separate telephone number and I just, I'm, I'm a bad business person. I'm not very organized. And then DWI makes a contract with Jordan to buy all these wigs. And then DWI does not pay Jordan. Now Jordan, of course, can sue the person DWI. So Jordan sues, what if the company is just not making much money? You know, we do import and export. We're just not, it's not a very good company. Can Jordan then sue me, David Warner? No. Because why did I open the company? Was it just to cheat Jordan? No. I'm just a bad business person, but that's not why I opened the company. So that's a pretty critical rule. Number three is cause. And we've seen this idea before. In, we saw it in torts. We saw it in contracts. This idea of proximate cause means this chain that we talked about. So why did Jordan get hurt? Did he get hurt because of DWI? Or was there something that broke the chain, right? We learned all of this stuff in contracts. But is the reason he got hurt because of my company? So let's say that Jordan makes a contract with DWI to sell wigs. And on the way, he puts the wigs in the box and he sends the box to the boat and he sends it to Tiffany's shipping company. And then Tiffany's shipping company accidentally gets the wrong address on the box. And then it never comes to me. And so I don't pay Jordan and Jordan sues DWI. Am I the reason that Jordan lost money? No, right? It's because Tiffany's company put the wrong address on the box. So you still need this chain of causation thing. And then the court's going to look at what we call the totality of the circumstances. The court's going to look at the big picture to decide, do we need to pierce the veil? And the answer is only if 
This is the only way to prevent injustice. So remember, the court doesn't want to break legal fictions. And one legal fiction is that there's a person named DWI, or there's a person named Apple, or a person named Walmart, or a person named Burger King. The court doesn't want to break these legal fictions. It's a pretty big deal to break the legal fiction and sue the owners. So if the court's gonna do that, it really needs, be, needs to be because this is the only way to have justice. So we have these three tests. Number one is unity. So how do we know if David Warner is separate from DWI? Well, I gave before the example of, do you have a separate bank account, telephone number and office? And definitely the bank account is the most important. Anytime you open a business or a company, you really want to have a separate bank account just for that. Even if you just go to your bank and open up another personal bank account, it's really important that you separate the money for the company from your own personal money. I think, yeah, it's like that, yeah. It's very important uh, to open yeah. bank account before process the process for the visa and something. Yeah. Yeah, in China, it's required. In other required. places, it's not, yeah, it's not always required in every country, but it's very important. Yeah. Wrongful conduct, we said, is why did you open the company? Was it for a bad purpose? Did you open the company in bad faith in order to cheat someone? Is that why you opened the company? You know, or were you just not very good at business? And then proximate cause, we all we said before damages must not be too remote. There must be this this sort of chain of causation that we've seen before, where one event caused another event, which caused another event, and we have this chain of events. So um, let's talk about proximate cause for a second. So we don't really talk in this class about insurance, but insurance is something that uses the idea of proximate cause a lot. So, and you don't need to know this, this definition at all, but just so you want, so you know, so you've seen it, because insurance is the kind of thing we might have to deal with in our lives. Uh, what you're most commonly going to deal with is car insurance. So if you hit something or you get into an accident or somebody hits you, you might have to deal with the insurance companies. After that, maybe health insurance. After that, maybe fire or home insurance. You know, but we want to understand what an insurance company is looking for. They're looking for the cause. What cause? The cause which set in motion this chain or train of events which brings about a result without the intervention of any force started and working actively from a new and independent source, this part means breaking the chain without breaking the chain, right? A new force, a new or independent force. Now, in my example with Jordan, Tiffany having a shipping company and putting on the wrong address, that is a new and independent force. It had nothing to do with me. So that would break the chain. But an insurance company wants to know what's the source. So for example, let's look at a, a little example. Jim is a guitar player in a local band and he plays on a Sunday evening. There's an encore, so they ask him to play more. And the encore is played, but because of this, Jim finishes later. He misses the train home. He has to take a bus. He does not get to bed until 1.30 a.m. In the morning, he oversleeps due to tiredness, and he's now in a big hurry. He quickly makes his breakfast, including toast. The postman arrives and rings the bell to give him a package, and they get into a conversation. And Jim goes back to the kitchen and finds that the toast has ignited on fire setting a kitchen towel on fire and the towel has burned his kitchen table and the kitchen table was a gift from his family and it's very expensive. So Jim calls the insurance company and says, I have insurance on this expensive kitchen table. 
So I need you guys to pay for the kitchen table to be fixed. What does the insurance company say? What was the cause? What was the cause that set in motion the train of events which brought about the result without breaking the chain? What the insurance company does not want to pay, right? So the end result is there was a table on fire. What caused the table to be on fire? What do you think, Harry? You there? Yeah. What do you think? Um, what caused the table to be on fire? I think it's Jim, isn't it? It's his carelessness. Well, I mean, going back, you know, sort of step by step, the towel was the first thing. Right, yeah. Or I should say the last thing before the fire. Now, what caused the towel to be on fire? He put it on... Go less big jumps, more step by step. Why okay. was the towel on fire? Because it was on the fire. <laughs> it was on the... Um... I think because the toast is burning. What's burning? Thank yeah, the, you. The, the... Because yeah, the so... toast is burning. Now, is there some sort of break in the chain between the toast is burning and the towel is on fire, or is that a natural progression? The doorbell rang. Well, okay, now you're going backwards in time. Oh. But okay, so the doorbell rings and the postman. Now, did this break the chain? If, Harry, if the postman did not come, would the toast have been on fire and lit the towel and burned the table? Maybe not. Maybe not. So the postman might break the chain. So the insurance company might say, it's not our fault. It's the postman's fault. Now, what happened before the postman? Why was Jim in such a hurry? Because um, he overslept. Okay, so that's Jim's fault. Why did he oversleep? Because uh, he got home late last night. Okay, why did he get home late? Because um, he finished later than expected and he missed the train. Okay, now, all of these things from he played music late and then he missed the train, he took a bus, he got home late, he slept. Is there anybody besides Jim involved here that could break the chain? The, the crowd? Well, they didn't really demand it. He could have left. But I, I think you make a good point. I would say by that same token, you could say the train or the bus. Maybe they came really late or they missed their stop. Or I mean, maybe. But if we assume that they were on time, then Jim has no one to blame but himself. So here we have, you know, Jim submits a claim to the insurance company for the table. And the cause of the loss, they're going to go backward, you know, the towel, the toast, the conversation with the postman, the arrival of the postman, he didn't set his alarm, he went to bed late, all of these things. And they'll look at whose fault is it. And the arrival of the postman, did Jim have to go answer the door at that moment? No. No. Did he have to have a long conversation with the postman? No. No. And therefore, probably the insurance company will not pay for this table. Do you understand why? Yeah, because it's um, due to his own negligence. That's, yeah, exactly. That's what they're going to say. They're going to say it's due to Jim's own carelessness. He, and not just his carelessness, his choices. He chose to play late, knowing he might miss the train. Then he chose to sleep late. He didn't set his alarm. Could he have called his mother and said, Mom, I need to get up tomorrow morning. Please call me and wake me up. Maybe. He chose not to do those things. Then he chose to go to the door. If you were making food in your kitchen and you had a pot boiling and it was about to boil over, would you go answer the door and have a long conversation? Maybe not. He made these choices. Yeah, Jordan. Uh, sir, do you think that the insurance company are, are fair? Are what? Are they fair? Fair. Are they Reasonable. fair? Yeah. 
Um, on a personal level, no. I think that the way most insurance companies work is they look as hard as they can with a magnifying glass to try to find a way to not pay. Because I saw uh, the history of Kim Kardashian, she's been burgled in Paris. Okay. And she, how to say, she, uh, she report uh, uh, to the company, uh, insurance company to pay for her jewelry is about 10 million or something like that. Wow. But the jewelry, uh, but the insurance, they said they want to sue her bodyguard because negligence of not protecting her. Sure. Well, in this case, if you really push the insurance company, they might sue the postman. They might sue the train. They might sue the bus. They might sue the um, location, the bar and say, why did you make Jim play an extra song? Yeah, insurance companies, they have a lot of lawyers on their team, so it doesn't cost them any money to sue people. So yeah, they don't wanna pay, definitely. But we just wanna understand when we are dealing with insurance companies, talk to them in the language of proximate cause. You always wanna look for the reason that it wasn't your negligence. You know, so if you're to, if Jim was talking to the insurance company and Jim understood law, he might have said, listen, this wasn't me. The postman came and was banging on the door. I had to go talk to the postman. And, you know, and then what would the insurance company sue the postman? They'd probably sue the post office because of vicarious liability. So, you know, Jim could try to avoid it by saying it. You know, that's the point. The point is to say it's not my fault in the language of proximate cause. I'm angry at my old business partner, Dan. We created a business together and he stole all of my customers and started a new business. I lost all of my money and I had to sell my house. So I decide I'm going to kill Dan out of anger. I'm going to poison him slowly. So I give him a lightly poisoned cookie. He takes one bite before bed and falls asleep. Ironically, he dies in his sleep from a heart attack. And I'm accused of murder. And I say, there's no cause. Is there proximate cause here? Um, Caitlin, are you, do you have bandwidth? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so Caitlin, what do you think? Did I kill this guy, Dan? Yes, I would say so. What? I didn't kill him. He had a heart attack. Well, if you look at proximate cause, maybe because he had the poison cookie and then fell asleep. Oh, but they did a blood test. Yeah, they did a blood test. He did not die from the poison. No, because maybe the poison was in the system while he fell asleep. It resulted in a heart attack. Maybe he didn't die of poison, but it being in his system. I didn't cause this heart attack, though. Well, you Did wanted I... to kill him. Oh, that's true. As well. That's true. Am I guilty of murder? Yeah. No, I didn't kill him. Now, in this case, this was, and it's a sad story, I'll tell you. It's a guy who wanted to kill his mother. Um, R. V. White. R. means Regina, which means the Queen of England. Okay, Regina and... For uh, the king, we say Rex, R-E-X. And for the, if it's a queen, it's Regina. So R means England, England v. White. And this defendant put poison into his mother's milk. He wanted to kill her slowly. She did not wake up uh, that night. She had a heart attack. She was not killed by the poison. And he said he wasn't trying to kill her once. He planned to give her a little poison every day. And they had tried to convict him of murder. Was he guilty of murder? No, but he did try. He's guilty of attempted murder, but he didn't actually kill her. The heart attack killed her. Does he go to prison? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, okay, back to, to uh, piercing the corporate veil. I'm the managing director for an import company in America, and we bring in many products from China and distribute them domestically. My contract says that if I leave the company, I won't 
steal customers. But I want to leave the company and I want to steal the customers. I, but I know I can't. So here's what I do. I open up a company called DWI. DWI starts to take the customers. And then my old company sues me. They said, David, you're stealing our customers. And I say, what? I'm not stealing your customers. DWI is stealing your customers. They're a person. You could sue them. Should the veil be pierced? Well, let's look at these three tests. Number one, unity. Uh, what do you think, Junpyo? Let's say me and this company were the same. I, I don't have a separate bank account or a separate anything. It's, we're all the same. We have unity. Why did I open this company, Junpyo? Um, to have a contract with Chinese company. Well, but why did I have to open a company? I wanted to leave the company. So cool, I could just leave the company. What did I want to do? Um, to, uh, you had a purpose to steal yeah. from the customers. That's what I wanted to do. Oh. I wanted to steal their customers. Is that a good reason to open a company? Is that clean hands? No. No, that's dirty hands. And did the company get hurt by me? This import company that I worked for, did they get hurt by me? Yes. Yeah, they lost their customers. This is a very famous case. Okay, let's, let's understand this case and then let's take a little break. So this is a very famous case and you need to know this for the final exam. This case is called GMC, Guilford Motor Company. You can call it Guilford, you can call it Horn, you can call it whatever, but I call it GMC. So what happened is exactly the same facts. There's this guy named Mr. Horn, and he's working for a GMC. GMC is a car company, motor. And it says in his contract that he can't steal the clients. But he's been working at this company for a lot of years, and he decides he wants to open his own car company to sell cars. And he wants to steal the clients. But he knows he can't do that. So... He, Mr. Horn, he formed a company and the sole purpose of the company was to steal the customers. When he was sued, his defense was his promise in his contract was only on himself, not on a new company. And the court said, no, you open this company just to steal customers. That is such a dirty hands, wrongful purpose. Okay, uh, let's talk about it more when we come back, but let's take a 10 minute break right now. Okay, we're recording again now. Missing so many people today. Oh, I have to decide, do I really wanna enforce these rules? If I do, so many people can't take the final exam. Oh, I have to think about that. Okay, and we were talking about the case of GMC, right? So this case of piercing the corporate veil. So in this case, um, GMC was allowed to pierce the veil and they were allowed to, uh, to sue Horn personally, even though he opened a company. They didn't just have to sue the company. Um, another example of piercing the veil. I run a company called Seaside Service and I ship oranges from America to China, to a Chinese company called Orange Source. So the Chinese company refused to pay the shipping charges. And that's actually very expensive, you know, to ship all of these hundreds and hundreds of boxes of oranges to China is very expensive. So they refused to pay. And I said, okay, they said they didn't have the money, they don't have the money. And after a few months of this, I say, listen, you have to pay. And then I sue them for the money. However, 
they're already bankrupt. And so they have no money. And so I want to sue the owner of this company. Now, actually, it turns out the owner of this company, he ran many corporations from one office with one phone. He mixed the money, the expense accounts together, and he let one company borrow money from another company. Now, I say, this is crazy. This guy was a terrible businessman. So I want to sue him personally. I want to pierce the veil. What do we think? So let's go through these three tests. Uh, Carlotta, are you there? No, Carlotta? Okay, uh, Caitlin. No, Caitlin? Okay. Yes, yes, sorry, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so Caitlin, uh, do you understand the question? Yeah, the three tests, so like the legal test, the Pearson yeah. Rail and yeah. Right, so test number one is unity. And what is unity about? Um, the unity of interest, in, it's like about like separate stuff. So like if you start a business, right? Um, sure, it's about is like the, the owner has like, is connected with their company, like with a bank account or phone number. Sure. So is the owner separate from the company? Are they really separate? Now, in this case, does it look like the owner is really separate from the company? No. No. So in that case, there is unity. And that's bad for him because he should have been separate from the company, but he wasn't. He mixed the money together. He let one company borrow from another company. He didn't have an office, didn't have a phone number. So, you know, no phone number, no office, no bank account. That's not good, we have unity. What about test number three? Was I hurt by this guy's actions, this company's actions? Yeah. Sure, right? I lost money because they refused to pay the shipping charges. That's their job, they're supposed to pay, they didn't. And the company went bankrupt, so I was hurt by them. But here's the problem, number two wrongful conduct. Did this guy open the company specifically to commit fraud against me? No. No. Why did he open the company? Just because he wanted his own company? Yeah, that's it. He just opened the company to do business. He was just bad at it. You know, so what should I have done? I mean, this is unfair, right? They didn't pay their shipping and now I've lost all this money. Any thoughts? This is just, I'm asking you to kind of guess. What should I have done? Any thoughts? Maybe ask the shipping company to sue them. Maybe, maybe. You know, what I would say is, I shouldn't have waited months. If they didn't pay me the first time, I should have said, Stop, sorry, I don't do business with people who don't pay me. That's it. You know, because what happened is in this case, this was Sealand versus pepper source and it was not about oranges. It was about peppers, but it's the same kind of facts. And this guy, the owner, Gerald Marchese was a terrible owner and they had lost 86,000 and change, a lot of money. So originally the district court said, of course, Sealand, you win because Pepper Source should have paid. Pepper Source never paid the freight bill and they should have. And so originally the district court said, yeah, absolutely, you win. But the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. Pepper Source wins. We can't pierce the veil. Why? Well, we have these tests, right? We have the unity of interest test. We have, they said, there's the second test is, would it sanction a fraud or promote injustice if we don't pierce the corporate veil? And they said about the first one, how do we know if there was unity? Now we've said before, we look at, was there the same telephone number, the same bank account, the same office, things like that. They gave us some other things. They said, they looked at four factors. They said, number one, 
Do you have adequate corporate records? If you're running a company and you have no corporate records, that's a problem. Harry, what's a corporate record? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, Tiffany, what's a corporate record? It's because like they didn't have any bank accounts and stuff. And sure, but what does that... a record mean? Uh, it's an official evidence in court to provide something. Sure. It is... Conducting a business. Is... Yeah, exactly. It's documents yeah. about conducting a business. Transactions, your bank account book, your notes from meetings. That's it. It's documents about running your business. You can't run a business and not keep anything. Now, it doesn't have to be on paper. Of course, it could be on a computer, but you can't run a business from your head. You have to have evidence. They didn't have any corporate formalities, no meetings, no discussions. It was just all run from this guy's head. There was the commingling of funds or assets. That's where you mix your money with the business's money. They said it's not about having a separate bank account. That's not just it. It's about are you mixing your money with the business's money? Are you undercapitalized? That means your business doesn't have enough money. You don't have enough money in your business. And then finally, allowing one business to borrow money from another business to treat the assets of another corporation as its own. So these are the four things that Sealand Services looked at for unity. All right, so I, and I said, this is all gonna be on the final exam. So I expect you to know all of this idea of piercing the corporate veil, right? This, these are the four tests for unity. In addition to the ones we just said, which are having the same telephone number, office, bank account, things like that. These are the four tests for unity. Hey, Isaac, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Remind me what unity is, please. Unity of interest and ownership. Um, it's whether you're, you. Who's you? It's whether a person is connected to the company or not. Not just like a person, what kind of person? Um, a, the owner of the company? Yes. Is either connected to the company somehow, like we've mentioned many times, uh, phone number, bank accounts, all that jazz. All that jazz, yeah, all that jazz. So yeah, is the owner of a company truly separate from the company? Or is it really the same thing, the company and the person are the same? If they're the same, you just don't get legal protection. Now, as we said before, as uh, I think Caitlin told us, the key here was the second part of the test, right? There is no doubt about unity. There's no doubt that this guy, the owner, Gerald Marchese, had unity. And there's no doubt that the last part of the test, the proximate cause, was also met, that this company, Sealand Services, was hurt by pepper source. But what the court said is, if an unsatisfied judgment is enough for the promote injustice feature of the test, then every plaintiff will pass on that score and the test collapses into a one-step unity of ownership test. And what that means is if, if they don't care about the second test, the wrongful conduct test, then every time someone doesn't separate themselves from the company, and then they owe money, you can always pierce the corporate veil. That's what would happen if you did not have the second part of the test. It would collapse into a one-step test. Is there unity? Yes, pierce the veil. Is there unity? Yes, pierce the veil. 
And then what's the point of having a company? Because anytime that most people have unity a little bit, I mean, how many people like Jordan opened his own company? Is Jordan fully keeping corporate records and corporate formalities and never mixing money? And does he have enough? I mean, come on. He just opened a company. You can't expect every single person to do all these things really for a small company. And the court said, the problem is if we don't have that second part of the test, the did you have clean hands part, then anybody who opens a company, we could pierce the veil. And then there's no point in having companies. So the second part of the test is really critical. Did the person open a company for a bad purpose? I start a company called Industrial. I don't have a separate bank account. I have no customers. I have no money. And I rent some office space in a building in Shanghai. Now, the offices are nice. So I decide I'm going to rent them to someone else and I'm going to find something cheaper for myself. I rent the office space to you. Who's you? Um, Jun Pio. I, I rent this office space to you. You use the space, but you never pay the rent to me, Jun Pio. So the building sues me, right? They win, and my company, Industrial, has to pay. But Industrial doesn't have any money or possessions or anything. It's just a name. So can they pierce the veil and sue me personally? So Junpio, I started a company called Industrial. Junpio, what did I do with my company? Um, you rented a place from the building. Okay. I rented a building or I rented some office space. Now, do I need to pay for this office space? Sure. Well, industrial needs to pay, right? Because they rented it. Yes. I just started the company. I'm the owner. So industrial rented this space. And then who did industrial rent the space to? Um, what was his name? His name was Junpio. Oh, yeah, from him, he rented. <laughs> Industrial rented the space to you, okay? Now, Junpio, let's say you're my good friend. And I say, hey, Junpio, don't pay me the rent. So you don't pay me anything. I say, hey, man, you're my friend, just live there. You don't pay me anything. And then I, and then in, so industrial has no money. They don't pay the rent. And then the company sues that owns the building. They sue industrial and industrial says, sorry, we don't have any money. Sue us. We don't care. Why did I open this company? Um, well, maybe you don't know because it doesn't say here. But let's say I open the money, this company in order to rent this place to give it to you for free. That's okay. why I opened the company. Is that a good purpose to open a company? No, it's a wrongful conduct. Good. It's wrongful conduct. So in this case, and remember, I said the court is going to look at the whole picture the totality. So it doesn't matter. It's not like you need test number one and two and three, unity, conduct, and cause. Maybe you just have number two, but it's so, so wrongful. That would still be enough to pierce the veil, maybe. The court's going to look at the whole picture. So in this case, it was called Kinney Shoe, and the facts were pretty much the same. And the defendant, this guy, Mr. Poland, he was the sole shareholder of this company, Industrial. And so the plaintiff, the Kinney Shoe Company, they rented, at least they rented a space to Industrial. Industrial then subleased to Mr. Poland. Do you see what Mr. Poland did here? Can you explain this, Tiffany? What did Mr. Poland do? I think he tried to do something that wasn't in the contract before. Well, and as a legal entity that couldn't have happened without trying to remove the debt on the property. 
Um, okay, I mean, that's a little bit confusing. Mr. Oh, okay. po Mr. Poland, he wanted to rent an office. Did Mr. Poland just go rent it himself? No, as the company, but not as Poland. So he created a company to rent the office. And then the company, the company that he created, rented the office to him. Why would he do that, Nicola? I'm, I'm totally confused. So okay. there is a company A that uh, lent the, the, the office to Mr. Poland. But instead, Mr. Poland do the contract, he opened company B and then the contract of the, the, okay. the offices. So there's, there's company totally... A and B, sure. Mm -hmm. So company A is called Kinishu. They own, Kinishu is a big company in America, they sell shoes and they own a lot of buildings. So Mr. Poland wanted to rent an office from them, but, he thought, I'm gonna be smart. Instead of renting it from them, I'm going to create a company B. And company B will rent it. Okay. So company B rented this from Kinishu. Mm -hmm. Now, company B, they have no money no income, no bank account, nothing. Yeah. Now, when they don't, company B doesn't pay. They rented this place from company A, but they never pay. So company A says, we're gonna sue you company B. So they sue company B and they win 166K. Does company B care? No, doesn't care. They don't care. They have no money. No Who cares? It's okay. And, uh -huh. and the defendant, Mr. Poland, remember, he opened company B. Yes. He thinks I'm a genius. Yes. I, I just found a way to cheat the system. I rented this place and I don't have to pay, my company has to pay, but my company has no money, so sue them, I don't care. Yeah, no liability. Right, and the district court found defendant is not personally liable. So according to the district court, they were like, sorry, sorry, Kinishu. This guy, Mr. Poland, he found a way to cheat the system. It's simple, you just, whatever you wanna buy, open up a company, have the company buy it and give it to you. You want to buy a new Ferrari? Open up a company called Nikola Company. Have them buy the Ferrari yeah. and give it to you and then never pay. Then the Nikola Company gets sued, but who cares? There's no money in it. Yes. It's going to cost you, what, 10,000 RMB to open a company or something? If the, yeah. So then you're paying 10,000 RMB for a Ferrari. Who cares? You'll lose the company. Who cares? And so when this went up, to the circuit court, the higher court, the appeals court, they said, no way. This is totally wrongful conduct. They said, you know, because the district court said, listen, Kenny Shu, it's your fault. You should have checked industrials finances. You're a company, they're a company. You should have done what's called due diligence. You should have checked. But the appeals court said, no way. While that's true, you should have checked. This guy, Mr. Poland, can't get away with this. I mean, this is the definition of dirty hands, opening a company to cheat someone else, right? So they said industrial wasn't capitalized. They didn't have money. And there was complete unity. The corporation was nothing but a shell. There was nothing in this company. It was just a shell. 
and you invest nothing in it, you get no protection. So industrial wasn't ready to handle their responsibilities. You don't get protection just from opening a company. It has to be a real company. Okay, so that gets us through everything I wanna say about piercing the corporate veil. Now, the next thing to talk about here is the forms of companies. So we've talked first about incorporation and this idea of making a company. But we also said it's possible to not do that and just have a business by yourself. That's called a sole trader. Now, what I want you to know for each of these forms of business is I want you to know pretty much the benefit and the drawback. So what's the benefit of opening a business by yourself? So this is a one person business. It is not a company, right? It does, it's not incorporated. So it's, we would say, unincorporated. Now, what's the, the biggest bad thing, the biggest drawback about this? Unlimited liability. So if you open a business today and you make a contract, if you get sued, they can go after your car or your house or your money in the bank. Now, let's say that, Tiffany, I make a contract with you and I just have my own personal business. And I make a contract with you for $100,000 uh, of, you know, let's say I'm buying, I'm buying um, boxes, black boxes from, um, with, with their diamond rings inside. And I have a contract with you for $100,000 of these rings. And then I break the contract. I don't pay you. Can you sue me? Technically, yes. Can you sue my father? No. Okay. So that's the key idea here. You still, we still have this rule called privity that the people in a contract can sue each other, but you can't sue anybody else. But in this case, because I have a business, not a company, you could sue me personally for my money in the bank account or my car, or my house or whatever. When I say you could sue me for my car, or my house, you don't usually get the car or the house. I would be forced to sell it and then give you the money. So the advantages though, it's very easy to start a business. Just go get a business license. Maybe you don't even need one. Just start selling things. If I want to, can I just start selling things today? Sure. Let's say I'm here in my apartment and I'm, I, have, I buy cheap white shirts and I paint them. Can I sell them? Of course. Everybody's allowed to do business. Another big benefit, responsibility, right? I make all the decisions. I have complete control. I control how I run everything, when I work, what I do with the money, and you can start doing business today. So it's really good. If you want to open a company, you can't just open a company tonight. You have to go find an agent. You have to do the paperwork. There are some background checks. You have to choose a company name. There's a lot of details. But with a sole trader, you could do it right now. Now, the disadvantage is, like I said, number one is the unlimited liability that you can be sued personally. Number two is this idea of succession. When, the, when you die, the business dies. And number three, you know, personal responsibility, while it's good, it also has a lot of drawbacks. You have to put in all the money. You have to deal with getting the employees. You have to deal with handling contracts. So there's some pressure there. But definitely the biggest drawback, no question, is the unlimited liability. And that's all I want you to know about sole traders. Next, I want to talk about a partnership. So a partnership is not unlimited in size. If I want to be partners, let's say with, I want to be partners with Carlotta. Hey, Carlotta, you turned on your camera. Hi. Carlotta, I want to be partners with you. Can we do that? Yes. Great. What about me, you, and Tiffany? Can you have three partners? Yes. Sure. What if we wanted to make the partnership, me, you, and Tiffany, I get 40%. You get, 
um, 5%. And Tiffany gets 55%. It has to be equal, no? No. No, it does not. So let's say Tiffany gets 60, I get 30, you get 10. Is that okay? Uh, I guess so, yes. Yes, absolutely fine. You could have a partner who gets 1%, right? Um, how many partners can we have? Up to 20. That's the American rule. It's different in different countries. But there's usually always a number. Now, there is one or one situation where you can have unlimited partners. And that is if you are professional company. So when we said professional, lawyer, doctor, architect, usually. It's the jobs that you need to pass a test to get a license. This is, I mean, if you know anything about lawyers, there is no such thing as a law company. It's called a partnership. Right? Lawyers try to get on the partner track to become partners. Lawyers don't become vice presidents. They become partners because law uses partnership law. So in a partnership, you don't need any writing. You don't need a contract. Now, we've learned this before, but let's say, Carlotta, I sign a, a partnership agreement with you, and it says... It says, David and Carlotta are partners. And in this agreement, Carlotta agrees she will get no money and she will be responsible for 100% of the debt if we lose money. And she has no control over the business. So you have no control, no profit, 100% of the debt. Are you and me really partners, Carlotta? Um, no, because... No. Uh... Does it matter that you signed a document agreeing that you and I would be partners? Does that matter? Um, yes. No. Mm. Look, if I sign a document right now telling you that, you know, I swear David Warner is seven feet tall, does that make me seven feet tall? No. Mm -hmm. You know, if I sign a contract telling you that I'm a woman, does that make me a woman? No. Contracts don't really mean that much. You know, there's just because you signed your name doesn't really mean anything. The same way we learned about exclusion clauses. If I have you sign a contract, Carlotta, that says, if um, I will do some, uh, what's it called? Uh, chiropractic. Do you know what chiropractic is? Yeah. Where somebody it's like, like, like moves your head and your shoulders to like fix your bones. And I say, I'm going to do that. If I hurt you because I'm careless, it's not my fault. Can I do that? No. No. Doesn't matter if you sign something, makes no difference. You just can't have certain things in writing. So what do we need to be partners, right? We know that we need something. Well, first let's talk about this advantage and disadvantage. What's good about a partnership? Well, what's good is you might get more money. So if Carlotta and, and I bring in Jordan as our third partner or Tiffany as our third partner, either they bring in money or maybe they bring in specialization. Maybe Jordan is a marketing expert and we need a marketing expert, but we don't have much money to pay a salary right now. So we tell Jordan, look, we'd like to make you a 10% partner. It's very similar to giving someone shares of stock, but you don't need to incorporate. So we don't have to do any of the expensive stuff about incorporation. Um, we also get to share the work. Now we do understand that we are foreigners Right now we live in other places, but usually living in China. In China, you can open a partnership, but you still need a license to do business as foreigners in China. You can't just start doing business and earning money, not without a license and not without a business visa. You cannot earn money as a student on a student visa 
or an internship visa. And if you have a work visa, you're not supposed to earn money outside your work. So China is very specific on how you need to do business. In your home countries, you could probably open a partnership and your partnership could open a branch office in China. I mean, there are ways around this. What are the disadvantages? Well, the biggest one is the same. It's not a company. So let's say Carlotta and I have this partnership. Let's say Carlotta, it's a real partnership. We're 50-50 on everything. Now we make a big contract with Jordan, a $500,000 contract. And recently, Carlotta, I lost all of my money in the stock market. There was a big crash. Do you have to pay all that money? Um. You lost your money on a crash and we're partners? Yep. What, what does the money have to do with me? Like I don't, well, I mean, before you and I were going to split everything, right? It's 50-50. And we made a contract with Jordan for $500,000. So if there's a problem and we can't sell the stuff, I owe half and you owe half, right? That's the way it was supposed to be. But I just lost all of my money in the stock market crash. Now, Jordan wants his $500,000. I don't have anything. Do you have to pay him all of it? No. Jordan, you say yes? Yes. Why? Let's not see the case you, you gave us last time about the uh, landlord. He signed the contract with them, and he's supposed to have 10000 per month. If the other guys, they didn't pay, he doesn't uh, care about those people. He has to, he just want his money. Sure. So Carlotta, does that make sense? No. <laughs> but we signed a contract with Jordan for 500,000, right? Yes. And Jordan gave us all of the diamond rings, right? So he wants to get paid. How much money does Jordan want to get paid? Um, the money for the diamond rings. Which was? I forgot. How, how could you forget this? $500,000. 500, yeah. That's what he wants to get paid. He gave us the rings. He has a contract. So he needs to get paid that much money. Do you and I have a partnership? Who owes him the money? Both of us. The partnership. The partnership. He made a contract with the partnership. He didn't make a contract with you or with me. He made a contract with our business. And our business has joint and several liability, exactly what Jordan just described with the apartment. We, the business, is responsible for 500000 The business has to pay. Now, if I can't, you do. Okay. Uh, now, David, may, may I ask, yeah. what about you own 90% of the company and Calora only 10%? It depends. When you say own, did we decide to share profits and not liabilities? Did we decide to share control? What did we decide? You know, I own 90%, she owns 10%, but in terms of our partnership, did we make an agreement that she will pay 10% of the debt? If we made an agreement that she will get 10% of the profit, pay 10% of the debt, then she'd probably only own, owe 10%. Oh, 10%. Right, because unless we're 50-50 partners. Um, but so it depends what you decide. But typically, if we don't have a very clear rule about debt, then we're both responsible for the partnership. Most people do not have a rule that limits your debt because then you're not really a partner. I have um, a question. Yeah. So what if Carlotta doesn't? Does it doesn't want to pay the five hundred thousand? Like well, then the police will go to Carlotta's house and they will arrest her 
while they put her house up for auction and they will sell her house and her car and whatever else she has and they will give that money to Jordan. What about you? You get the same punishment. Yes. Sure. But if I lost everything, I lost my house, I lost my car, I lost everything in the stock market crash. All right. My job is to answer telephones at a law firm. And I've worked there for six months. I tell my boss I want to raise. And my boss tells me that he'll make me a partner. I'm going to get 20% of the profits every year, but I have no control over the business and I'm not responsible for the losses. And we sign a partnership agreement. After working for a few more months, I discover the law firm doesn't make very much money and the business isn't successful. My raise would be 20% of almost nothing. So I decide to quit the job, but I'm now a partner and I want 20% of the company and I sue the boss. And the boss says, David, you're not really a partner. And I say, come on, man, we signed a partnership agreement. Am I a partner? What do you think? Um, Caitlin, do you think I'm a partner? Caitlin. No, Caitlin, how about Harry? Harry, do you think I'm a partner? Um, maybe not because it's it to do like the amount of control you have in the in the company. So I have no control, and I'm not responsible for losses. So what? Why does a partner need to have control? So what the court said is they're not partners. Now, let's say that you're my friend, Harry. We're just good friends. And I have a business. And I tell you, Harry, you're my good friend. I'm going to give you 20% of the profits of my business every year. But you have no control and you're not responsible for any losses. Same situation. What am I really doing? You're what am I giving you? You're just giving me money every year. Yeah, but I'm not paying a gift tax. I'm just finding a way to give you money. So what this is actually called, and this is an important case, Fenwick said, this isn't, this isn't a partnership. They're, they aren't partners. And the reason this is an important case is Fenwick made a rule. So they said, this is not anything besides what's called profit sharing. It's just about their financial relationship. This is a profit sharing agreement. Can you make a profit sharing agreement? Sure, you can, but you're not partners. And the reason this is so important is partners have rights. Partners have rights and responsibilities. Just like we looked at in agents, an agent has a right and a responsibility. Let's go back to my example with Carlotta. Carlotta, you're my partner, 50-50, okay? And our business, we sell jewelry. Now, I go out today and I meet Nicola for lunch, and Nicola sells gold necklaces. Can I, Carlotta, can I make a contract with Nicola for our partnership to buy some of his gold necklaces, or do I need your permission? Permission, you need an agreement? Do I need to get you to do this or can I do it? Um, we're both partners. Um, do you need to get me to do it too? Nope. No? I can make an agreement with Nicola without you. Now, this money that now we owe Nicola, we owe him the money. Yeah. And if I lost all my money in the stock market, now you owe him that money. Now, Carlotta, if our business needs a, needs a new computer, could you go out to the Apple store and buy a computer in the name of our partnership? Sure. And could you go out and buy a car? Sure. If the partnership needs one, and then we 
owe the money to the car dealer, right? You and I can make contracts that bind each other. And this is a very serious power. What it also means is that we are both agents. The good, no, 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 da. All of those responsibilities we just learned now apply to both of us. Being a partner is a big deal. So to be a partner, you need intention. You can't do it by accident. This is the Fenwick rule. You need to share profits. Now, as I said, it doesn't have to be 50-50. It could be 90-10, but you got to share profits. You have to share losses also. And you have to share control. Profit, loss, control. If I have no power, I'm, we are not partners. Right? If I have no power or if you have no power, we both have to have real power to run this business. Not just like a tiny bit of power. You know, you say you get 10% of the debt or whatever, like part of the question is how much power do you have? Now let's say that I have a company, okay? I have this company and I need to borrow money. I go to the bank, but they won't, they won't lend me money because I don't have anything. I don't have assets. So I get some money from, from Isaac. Okay, Isaac, you lend me money. Isaac, you there? Yeah. Okay, good. So I borrow money from you. And Isaac, here's what I do with the money. I go to the bank and I use the money that you gave me as security to get a loan from the bank. So now I have some money from the bank. Now also I, I need more money. So I borrow some more from Junpio. And in return for Isaac's money, I give Isaac a profit sharing agreement. So every year, Isaac will get 10% of my business. And Junpio's really angry about this. You know, he wants the money back. And I say, listen, man, I don't have the money. And Junpio says, no problem, I'll sue Isaac because Isaac is your partner. Is Isaac my partner? Isaac, are you uh, my partner? No. Why not? It's, it's like the example we just, we just uh, looked at. It's just profit sharing. I don't have any control. I don't share losses. Okay, good. So this case is also a famous case called Martin v. Pay uh, Payton. And in this case, you had this company, KNK. And Mr. Payton lent money to KNK. KNK then used the money to get a bank loan. And in return, so the defendant here would be like Isaac. Isaac got a profit sharing agreement and an option to join the company to be a partner. Right now, Isaac is a creditor. Um, now, Mr. Martin is someone else who borrowed, who lent me money, lent money to KNK. And KNK didn't pay him. So Mr. Martin now is trying to sue Isaac and says, Isaac is a partner. And the lower court said, defendant, Isaac is not a partner. He's a creditor. He just lent money. And the court of appeals agreed, right? So why is Isaac not a partner? in the opinion of the court. What did the court say? Why is Isaac not Isaac? Can you explain this, this analysis? Why are you not a partner? Um, Cause I think what they're saying is that I have no control. So like I cannot initiate transactions. Correct. And anything like that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the key words I use to bind. To bind is to make someone in charge of something, to make someone do something, right? Isaac can't go out and buy, buy, uh, buy gold necklaces from Nicola. Isaac can't go out and buy computers or buy cars. 
If he does those things, I don't have to pay for them. KNK doesn't have to pay for them because he's not a partner. Being a partner really has a lot to do with your legal relationship, your ability to initiate transactions. Um, I'm going to start a bowling alley with my good friend, um, Harry. Harry, we're going to start a bowling alley together. And I put in most of the money and I rent the space and you're going to do most of the work. But Harry, you are impossible to work with. You show up late, you're drunk, you leave early, you borrow tools and then you lose them. And I just can't deal with this anymore. So after about three and a half months, I decide we should end the partnership. And Harry says, I can't. So I go to court to sue to end the partnership. What do you think, Harry? Can I end the partnership? I'm not sure, really. I don't know what the rules are like to just end the partnership. What do you think? What's your opinion? Um, I think no. I mean, it it'd probably have to be like mutual consent, like. But you're impossible to work with. Tiffany, what do you think? Should I be able to end the partnership with Harry? I don't think so. You you don't think so? Tiffany, you wherever they're doing construction near you, aren't they? Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. Heavy construction. That's okay. Um, okay, so this is very similar to the idea of marriage. Can you end a marriage if the person is impossible to live with? Harry, can you end a marriage if a person is impossible to live with? Um, through, through law, they don't like to separate people, do they? But can you? If they're impossible to live with? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can. You can yeah, you definitely through. can. The divorce rate is like 50%, right? You can definitely stop living with somebody. What that's called in the law is irreconcilable differences. So the rule is pretty much the same, the same rule, which is if you and the other person, because marriage is a partnership, if you and the other person have lost all confidence and cooperation, that's really the rule. If all confidence and cooperation are gone, then you can end a partnership, especially where one of the part partners hinders the partnership. And remember this word from contracts to make it difficult for someone to complete the partnership. Okay, so I said one thing that's really important about partners is to understand their duties and responsibilities. There are not as many as there were for agency, but those are ones you need to know anyway, the good no, 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 da. Now for duty of partners, there's four. Disclosure. What does disclosure mean? Caitlin, you there? No? Uh, Nicola, what's disclosure mean? Uh, it provides information. You cannot uh, hide information. Okay, sure. You can't hide information from other partners. What's account? account is uh, it's related to to money it's related to gifts. hide money gifts. gifts ah yes, yes yes yeah not just money could be money but if i give you a car or i give you a vacation to hawaii whatever it is you got to tell if i'm your partner you got to share this information so it's the same idea about sharing information non-compete Right, what does that mean? Maybe it's this, uh, like that example, you, you take the, the clients and so on. Um, well, if you and I have a partnership and we sell, um, we sell, 
actually sell. It would be something fun to sell with Nicola. What would be of a good time selling? Um, I would enjoy, let's see, if we hung out together and we were selling whiskey. Whiskey. All right. Fine. <laughs> we'll sell whiskey. Right. Now, what if I also open a, a whiskey company on my own? Are you yeah. comfortable with that? No. No, because, I mean, who am I making money for? Am I making money for us or am I making money for me? I'm yes. competing with the partnership. So competing yes. is when you open your own business to do the same thing you're doing in the partnership. And of course, there's a temptation to do this because you and I are selling whiskey and I get really good connections. And I think, yes. hey, and I could use these connections to sell it here in New York. Right now we're selling it in Shanghai, but I got this great connection from you from, you know, wherever, from Brazil. Maybe I can just sell it in New York. It doesn't hurt you. We're selling it in Shanghai, but come on, you want to make that New York money too. Yeah. And then finally, good faith, right? Just the idea of clean hands. You have to have clean hands in a partnership. The owner of a hotel rents an old building to me. I'm going to fix it up and use it as my hotel. Now, Nicola, you and I sign a partnership contract. You're going to give me half the money and you'll get half the profits. And you're also responsible for half of the losses. Although you provide the money and you're responsible for half of the losses, I'm really responsible for day to day. You're just very busy. You're a very busy business person. So I do the running of the hotel. If there are big decisions, I ask you you know, but um, we do make money in our first year. Now, after the lease is up, the hotel owner, he and I have a really good relationship and he offers to rent me different buildings um, at a really good price for 20 years. It's a very good deal. So I accept and I don't tell you. When you find out about the deal I made, you sue me. You say we're partners and I had an obligation to tell you about the deal. But I say, hey man, we're partners in this hotel. We're not partners in this other building for 20 years thing. Did I have to tell you about that? Uh, I think yes. Why? Because of your duty of disclosure, because of your duty of uh, those duties in the previous slide. I don't recall all of them. Sure. Well, I have a duty accounting. to disclose, but what I say is, well, I do tell you everything about the hotel. Mm -hmm. I don't. But what about the the duty of non compete? Because this is kind of you are competing. Okay. What if I'm not? What if one of them is a hotel and one of them is movie theaters? Uh, yeah, but for me, uh, it's still the same. You are using the 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 connection connections that we build uh, towards the company, towards our partnership to sure. have this kind say, of benefit. Yeah, that's the key word, right? I got a benefit. Why do I even know this landlord? I know exactly. him because you and I are in this partnership. So what the court said is, and the facts are the same. The court said, okay, we'll give the plaintiff, that's you, 49%. So I can still control it, but I have to give you half of the money. Um, anything else? How about, there's a couple other cases, but you can read those on your own. Um, how about, well, let's look at this one, Mihan V. Shaughnessy. So in Mihan V. Shaughnessy, you had two lawyers and what the lawyers did was pretty terrible. They, they sent letters to all of the clients saying that the company they work, is ter they work for is terrible and that they're going to start a better company. And they asked the clients to join them. And then when they have lots of clients ready, they walk into the boss's office and they say, we're quitting right here, right now. And they walk out. Did they break the duties of a partnership? 
what do you think, Carlotta? Did they break the duties of a partnership? Uh, by not uh, by not asking the other partner. Well, they didn't tell the boss that they were going to open up another law business. Uh, no. Well, they have a duty to provide full information to all of their partners. Do you think the boss wanted to know they were going to do this? No. Yeah. They didn't get any yes, benefit but, yet. Uh, they can tell the boss, like, I'm doing it. Right? Okay. What about this, though? What they did by writing letters to their customers saying, this business is terrible, you shouldn't go there. Imagine I did that to your parents at CIP. I wrote letters to all of them that said, CIP is terrible. It's a bad school with bad education, don't go there. I'm gonna open up my own school called DIP, the David Institute of, um, what's the P for? A program, the David International Program. And you should come to DIP instead. And then when I get enough of you to agree, then I walk into Ealing's office and say, I quit. Is that good faith? No way, right? That's super, super bad faith for me to do something like that. Now, Carlotta, would it be okay if I went to Ealing today and said, listen, Ealing, me and my friend Jordan, we plan to open another international school in Shanghai. So, um, we already have the government documents. We're going to start looking for students. I just, I feel like I need to tell you this. Can I do that? Jordan? I think, yes, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, you can't. Sure, I can do that. Am I telling Ealing what she needs to know? Sure. I'm not getting any benefit. Now, am I competing with her? No, because I'm going to leave CIP when I open my school. Am I using good faith? Yeah, my hands are clean. I'm allowed to run a business. I don't have to stay at CIP. I'm allowed to open another school, but I have to be honest about it. Yeah. The rights of partners. So the real big right is this idea of binding the partnership. Right, this idea, and we've already learned about apparent authority. If I go to uh, meet Nicola and I say, hey, I represent the Carlotta and David Jewelry Partnership, even if I don't, if Nicola believes me, then I do. So I have the power to make contracts that will bind Carlotta, that will bind my partner. That's a really big power. You know, and then also you have the right to share in profits. It's not always equal. You have the right to be indemnified. Anybody remember what this word means? Anybody? What's indemnified? Paid back. So let's say that Carlotta and I have a partnership and I'm going to meet Nicola and Carlotta says, hey, David, we're gonna, we have a meeting set up with Nicola. Can you please take him to dinner? at this nice restaurant. So I take a taxi to meet him, take him to a nice dinner. Afterwards, we go to a bar, we get some drinks, and then I take a taxi home. The partnership has to pay me back for my expenses. That's indemnification is to be paid back. Partners also have a right to have some kind of control in the management of the firm. Partners have the right to look at the accounts. Carlotta cannot hide the financial records from me. And I also have the right to veto. What's a veto? Carlotta, what does that mean? I can veto. Um, Do you know? Do you know this word? No. Jordan, what does it mean? It means that to stop something. You can put your veto to stop yeah. something. To her. So, Carlotta, if you want to bring in a new partner, I can stop you. And if you want to change the business, 
I can stop you. We have to agree. Okay, that's part of the partnership idea. Now, as we said, it could be an 80-20 partner. And in that case, you have rights, but you can't stop me, you know. Uh, one more case on partnership, and then we're done with that. So, okay, you and I decide we're going to go to business together. I'll go into business with um, Tiffany. Okay, Tiffany, we're going to go into business together. We're going to find old buildings and then fix them up and sell them for a profit. You, Tiffany, put up the money. And I, David, do all the labor, all the work. In the end, uh, so we sign a contract that says we share the profits. The contract doesn't say anything about losses and we lose money. Now the initial money was all yours and you say, David, you have to pay half the losses. But you know, you put up the money, I did all the labor. Do I have to pay for half of the money? What do you think, Tiffany? Uh, first of all, you're not my employee. We're partners yeah. in this um, uh, not official relationship, but it's it's a it's implied, I guess. You think it's implied? I should pay for half of the money because of the effort on the losses. I think, and it's not something that was discussed before, and probably doesn't make sense. When okay. I tried to so the court generally agrees with you. The court says, if you didn't discuss losses and one person did all the work and one person did all the labor in that case. So generally the law presumes that you intend to partner, uh, participate equally, but if one person put in all the money where one party provides all the money and the other provides all the labor, neither party is responsible to the other for losses. Each party loses what it provided. So Tiffany would lose her money and I would lose the time and effort that I put in. So this case is an exception to the general rule. The general rule is that every partner intends to participate equally in the profits and losses. Okay, and that's all we're gonna say about partnerships. The last thing to talk about is to talk about companies. And we started talking about companies, but let's see if we can get a little bit into this. Um, maybe just like 10 more minutes. So it is possible to have something that's in the middle of a partnership and a company. And that's what a lot of people do these days uh, in America, at least. China doesn't have this yet. China has something similar called a V, I think it's called a V company. Um, but what we call this is an LLP. So an LLP is a partnership, but it's limited liability. And this was created to have sort of the best of both worlds, where you have a partnership. So it's a little easier to create. You have the benefits of the rights and the duties of partners. You have the benefits of being able to bind people. You have the, um, the benefits of the small partnership, two to 20 people, but you also have limited liability. So limited liability means you are a separate legal entity. You have to incorporate. So you must incorporate an LLP. And that can be, you know, the problem with LLPs. So the advantages of this, limited liability and LLP, your limited liability partnership. You have perpetual succession. You can live forever. Um, you can make contracts and buy and sell property. And, you know, all of these things that a company can do. But you still have some of the benefits of being a partnership which is the rights and duties that partners have. So what's the difference between this and opening a company? Well, let's say that I open a company to teach English and I hire you, Nicola, Tiffany, Jordan, Isaac, Caitlin, you know, Carlotta, I hire you guys. What kind of responsibilities do you have to me as my employees? Well, we haven't learned employment law yet. We'll learn that as our next subject. 
but you don't have a very high duty of care to me. I have a pretty high duty of care to you because I'm the boss. But you guys don't have a lot of responsibilities to me. You have kind of like good faith. I mean, that's about it. What about this duty to account, duty of disclosure, duty of non-compete? No, you just have good faith. But if we're all partners in the business, now we all have these duties. And that's pretty useful. Disadvantages, it's incorporated. It takes time, it takes money. You have to file accounts and taxes and everything like that. So an LLP is useful, but one of the problems with an LLP, a big problem, you can't sell stock. We could bring in another partner, but you can't sell stock because it's not a company. It's a partnership. Selling stock is pretty important for a company, right? We want to be able to sell stock. So let's talk just a little bit about that. What is a company? So a company is very simply an incorporated organization. That's it, right? There are different kinds of companies, but they're all incorporated. And we understand what this means now. Incorporation is a process. It started with Salomon v. Salomon. It gives a legal personality. It creates a separate legal entity. A company is responsible for its own debts. Companies have legal rights like own property, make contracts, sue and be sued. Companies have perpetual succession. They can never die. Companies have limited liability. These are all the things we already know. And we already talked a little about the difference between private and public. Uh, can you remind me? Remind me, Junpyo, what's the difference between private and public companies? Um, public limited companies are like Apple, which has stock in their markets. Good. Private limited companies are like rest of 99%. Yep. Good. So public limited company, also called PLC, they put their stock on the stock market. And that means anybody can buy it. Anybody can buy Apple stock. I mean, as long as you're over 18, because you do, it is a contract to buy it. So you can't be a child, but you know, anybody can buy the stock with a private company. You can sell stocks, but it is a criminal offense to offer shares to the public. You can sell shares to your friends and to your family and to your investors Right? If I open a company and I want to sell shares to you guys, it doesn't matter if you're my family or friends. I could have a sale for investors, but I can't just put it out in the newspaper for, any, for the public to buy. That's criminal. Why would that be criminal? Can anybody explain to me? I mean, that's pretty serious to say it's criminal to sell stock. Why? Anybody have any thoughts? Uh, is it because of uh, there is no regulation? I mean, that's part of it. A big part of it, was somebody else going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say maybe, maybe it's because there's not as many shareholders. <clears throat> but there could be. But like public companies have like a ton of shareholders and they have like a board of like directors, right? And like huge Okay, chairs. so the board of directors thing. That's pretty true too. Let's say that we're talking about this public company. They have a ton of shareholders. They have lots of, uh, they have a board of directors. And as Nicola said, they also have lots of regulations. Now, if, they, if I buy a share of Apple stock today, whatever happens with the direction of the Apple company, how they spend their money and what they use their money for and all that stuff, that's controlled by a board of directors. Every three months, Apple has to give lots and lots of information to the government. In that sense, it's pretty safe. Now, let's say I have a private company, DWI. I just opened this little company and I put my, my sales, my stock into the newspaper and I sell it to everybody. And all of you guys buy shares of stock. I could just close my company tomorrow and take the money. 
I could do anything I want. I could spend it all on cookies. I could spend it all on guns or drugs. Or I mean, what are you going to do about it? There's no board of directors. It is a private company. I don't need to give that much information to the government. I could donate it all to a hate group or terrorist organization. I mean, you know, it is very serious that companies can really raise a tremendous amount of money. So we need to be pretty critical and careful about what the company reports. You know, what if I just wanted to open up a company to support, you know, Christian values and I sell shares of my company for, you know, a million dollars each. And you, I mean, come on, like, this is just a, a very dangerous way for people to raise money without any real regulations. You know, it's, you don't have to tell the government very much if you're a private company. And as I said, you know, in the UK, at least, public companies are less than 1% in the UK and they own more than 99% of private companies. Public companies are huge. Now that most public companies start private and then they have an IPO. An IPO is an initial public offering when they become successful and that's where they sell stock. Um, in terms of the difference between private and public, I'm not gonna ask you this on the final exam. You know, I'd like you to know that a public company puts their stock on the stock market. I think that's an important fact that you should just know in the world because public companies, they run the world. And that's pretty important to understand and to know something about that. The average person who didn't study any sort of law or corporate stuff, they, they wouldn't understand that like this world is run by public companies. You know, private companies own almost nothing. And they are almost all the companies, you know, but they just don't own much. So there's a difference, you know, for PLC versus LTD. Private companies have LTD in their name, limited. Public companies have PLC in their name. There's, you know, how much share capital. I'm not going to get into this stuff. This is more corporate law. If you ever want to talk about it, you know, what is a director or um, a company secretary or an annual general meeting or written resolutions, you know, just send me a WeChat. We'll have a Zoom. You know, we could always have an extra class and talk about corporate law or something if people are interested. There's another kind of company, though, called an unlimited company. And that's interesting. That's a company that has legal personality. It's incorporated, but the owners have agreed to have unlimited liability. And if you do this, you do not have to publish your accounts. This is not common of course, but this is used to shield finances. So what this means is, let's say I wanna open a company and I wanna open a company because I want to collect money to pay for, I support um, religious groups that wanna build a wall in America. You know that whole Trump thing, build a wall? Right? So let's say I open a company because I want to do that. But I don't want my shareholders to know this. You know, a lot of people don't support this. So I sell cookies, cookies and ice cream. And, you know, it's that kind of company. It's a food company. I don't want people knowing that I support the wall, but I do. What I can do, because if I open a private company, I do need to tell the government where my money is going. And anybody can see those. If you're, a, if you're a shareholder, you could buy one share of stock and then you can go investigate and find out that all of my money goes to the Christian right groups or to build the wall. You, and then you could maybe write a newspaper article about it. So here's what I can do. I can open what's called an unlimited company. Now, I don't need to tell the government where my money goes, but I have unlimited liability. The government says, hey, if you want to take the responsibility to be personally liable for the company, then okay, you don't need to tell us what you're spending your money on. Now, this happens a lot with big companies. I'll give you an example. I think one of them was Nabisco. And you wouldn't know if you're not American, but Nabisco is a company that makes cookies, cookies and biscuits and missile triggers. Triggers for nuclear missiles. 
Now, they don't want their cookie customers knowing that. So Nabisco owns, like I said, many of these companies own many smaller sub companies and they own a small sub company that's unlimited liability to sell weapons to the military and guided missile systems and things. Another example was, um, I think I think it was uh, Snapple. If anybody knows the drink Snapple, they were donating money to the KKK. If anybody knows what that is, it's a hate group. And so they had an unlimited liability company so that they don't need to tell anybody what they're doing with their money. You know, like there are a lot of companies that do some pretty dark things. You know, if they're a big company, part of their company is sort of like clean. And then they do other things that are not so clean and they don't want people to know. So most companies are limited. Almost all companies, any company you open, you know, Jordan opened a company, it's a limited company. Jordan can't sell his stock on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a limited company. Now, how is it limited? I would say I'm sure Jordan's company is limited by shares. Jordan, do you know how many shares your company has? Yes, they told me not up to four. What? Not up to four people. No, no. How many shares do you have? Right now? How many shares can you sell? Ah, that, they didn't tell me that. Okay, you can find out. It's in your articles of association. You should make sure you have your articles and your memorandum. But I think everything in Chinese. Okay, probably I would guess you have a million shares. Oh yeah, that's a, they said. This is how to say. It. I expected to have it in fifty years, like one one million. Okay, so a million shares, and that means, and most companies start with something like that. You, if you want, you could change it. You could have 100,000 shares. But the reason it's like a million is if you wanted to sell shares for $1 each, sell them all, you got a million dollars. You know, you can sell all these shares. That's called a company limited by shares. And that's most companies. But it could also be limited by guarantee. And that would be a little different. That says, if the company goes out of business, they promise to pay a certain amount of money. That's if you want to take a risk. So let's say that Jordan opens this company. We all really believe in him. Um, and Jordan says, you know what, guys, I'll give you a share. And you don't have to pay me anything right now. But if the company goes bankrupt, then you have to pay me $5 each. So our shares, we're taking a risk. We think the shares will go up. And then in time, we could sell them. But there's a risk because if the company goes bankrupt, we could owe money, but we don't have to pay now. Most shares aren't like that. Most companies, you buy the share, you pay money now. Now, a company actually could choose to have you pay half. Why? Let's say Jordan wants to sell shares for $10 each. He could have us pay $5 now and $5 at a, a different time. Why might he do that? What would be a benefit of doing that? Any thoughts, Harry, what do you think? Can you repeat that, sorry? Sure. I said, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Um, Junpio, what do you think? Why would Jordan want to sell his shares for half of the money now and get half of it later. Um, Correct. Mm. <laughs> Nicola, what do you think? <laughs> what? Guarantee. Guarantee, but why? Why do that? Companies do it, but why? I think okay. I, I think it's it's like uh, how can I say? It, it's kind of it split the. No, no, no. It's like let's first. Back, let's go back to Harry. Oh, oh, Tell oh, me, oh. Harry, what do you think? Oh. You gonna make me say the question again? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think. 
Mm. What would be, Harry, what would be the danger if you had a company of selling shares and getting all that money right now? Um, that you lose the shares? <laughs> well, if you opened a company and then you sold shares to a bunch of people and right now you got a million dollars, what if you were tempted to waste it? What if you made bad investment decisions and then you spent all the money? What do you do? Your company is going to go out of business. So what a lot of people do is they decide, let me just protect myself from myself. Let me get half of the money now so that no matter what kind of decisions I make, no matter what happens in the future, I'll still have half of that money coming in. Does that make sense? All right. All right. Well, you guys have been good. You've, oh, I made you stay an extra 20 minutes. So thank you so much. You guys have been good. We'll stop there for today. Um, as I said, for anybody who wasn't here at the beginning, we have like, three, like four classes left. That last class will be a final review. Start getting your notes and materials together now, because I'm not going to teach stuff again on the review. We'll do practice questions together. We probably have three classes left we are almost done with this. We have one page left. Then we'll do employment law. And then we might have a little time, like one class to do secured transactions. And that's good. That's everything we're trying to do this semester. Um, I don't have an exact date for the final yet. I don't have your midterms yet, but I will next week. Um, anything, any questions? Yeah, sir, it's about the final exam. Yeah. Uh, are, we, are we going to do like what we did in midterm, like two? put like cases or something or yes. just like a, okay. um, Well, lo, let me change that. No, because the midterm was an essay and this will be an exam where you have like three hours, you have a story and you need to figure out what was the, you know, for example, can you uh, like, is this, what kind of business did this person open? Is it a sole trader? Is it a partnership? Are these people partners? What kind of responsibility do they have? But then also you have to figure out, well, what about this contract? Was there a good offer, acceptance, in intention, consideration, certainty? Well, what about this person they hired? Is that person an employee? You know, so there's a bunch of different legal stuff in the story. Okay. So we don't need to put like reference of different yeah. cases. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to memorize cases or put references in or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, then let me transfer control. I'll give it to Tiffany today. <laughs> okay, you are Thank now the host. You. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.